Chuck, there's a lot of crossover between films and comics, films and comic art. Yeah. One example of crossover is where a feature film was had a comic adaptation, right? Uh, and I know that this was a frequent process in the 70s and the 80s. You know, in the pre-internet era, it was people went and saw a movie, they loved the movie, they craved more content, they wanted to get their hands on toys, whatever it might be. And a comic book was a frequent tie-in for a major motion picture, right? right? Yeah, usually, uh, you know, when you saw the movie hit the hit the screen, um, there was always a comic adaptation waiting, uh, you know, usually on the newsstands at the same time. And uh, that was pretty common. So a lot of artists would have to... Uh, They'd have to draw the comic, ironically, off of whatever material was was you know made available to them before the right, production. Right, probably eight by tens and things yeah, like that. Yeah, a lot of yeah. photo reference and all these things. So it's funny when you read some of these adaptations; they don't always match up to exactly how the movie uh, turned out. Um, but they did the best that they could with the material that they had, so that they could all sort of be released at the same time. Yeah, and, and this is an example of an adaptation where. Uh, there was actually a three-part uh, series here for Raiders of the Lost Ark, and so this was part one. And here's a page of artwork that was done specifically for that. Um, and then you'll recognize this from the, the original sequence, where, and I remember it very uh, distinctly, where this guy ends up getting speared by the uh, spears, and I'm surprised that the, you know, the comics code allowed them to show that. <laughs> I guess it made it into the movie as well. Um, but here's an example where, you know, again, they took the movie, they adapted it sort of uh, not say panel by panel, but you know it, it matches very much to the screen of, of what you would have experienced with that. And this was drawn by uh, John Buscema, inked by Klaus Janssen. Um, and so, uh, again, some of the Zipatone that you'll see there to, to highlight Indy's face. Yeah. Uh, but it was interesting. They, so they, they actually, after this adaptation, um, it was very popular. And so I think, as you said, that, you know, Indiana Jones was something that people craved. And so they actually continued it in a regular title called The Further Adventures of Indiana Jones. Uh, but from what I heard on that, and you, and you look at the comic, you always wonder why it doesn't Indiana Jones look look the same as he did in the adaptation or in the movie. Well, they didn't want rights issues. Didn't, yeah, it was rights issues that they yeah. didn't want. Um, they didn't want him to look like Indiana Jones, so they always told the artist to sort of make him look a little bit more obscure. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. So. yeah. <laughs> but I would assume something like this is highly desirable because it yeah. appeals to multiple collecting segments, right? It's going to appeal to comic art collectors. It's also going to appeal to film memorabilia collectors and just fans of Raiders, of which there are many. Yeah, and it, it took me a while to find this great example of a, a page from Raiders. I had to say Star Wars. I'd love to own something from the first uh, you know, adaptation of that. Very difficult to find. Um, I've been looking for years because that was really when I, was, I lived in Indonesia. That was really the first comic book I read over there because my parents bought it for me. I couldn't see Star Wars until I got back into the States in 1978. So oh, interesting. That the, at the comic book adaptation was my first experience with Star Wars. So, of course, I'd love to own that. But uh, yeah, those are, those are very coveted at, at this point. I'd love to see some of those hit the market. Yeah, and so something like the Star Wars pages that you're talking about, do they rank right up there with some of the top Marvel and DC? As far as uh, interest, level. yeah, you know it's interesting. The um, there's there's a story. I was having dinner with Jim Shooter, who was the editor in chief in the '80s, and, and a little bit he was there in the '70s as well. And he was saying that the Star Wars franchise actually was was one of the things that saved the Marvel because that that comic book, the first adaptation of Star Wars, was reprinted so many times um, that it actually kept you know them as a publisher afloat because a lot of the titles were sort of sinking in. In, uh, in demand back in the 70s. But uh, these adaptations really sort of, uh, you know, took on a life of their own. And I think the Star Wars comic, uh, I think it ended uh, with issue 107, lasted for a long time, and is, you know, now has been redone many, many times by different publishers, Dark Horse, and then Marvel now has it back now that uh, Disney has, has the licensing for, for the, the Star Wars franchise. Uh, but you see these, these taking on a life of their own and taking on new adventures, and I think that was very cool to be able to see you know, almost new movies that were made, and I think you know, movie people that collect movie props and, and are sort of into the movies should also look at the comics and, and also the art to say, you know, maybe uh, this is a way of enjoying your favorite characters in movies. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting, and I know that there's sort of a, a flip side of these adaptations as well, which is obviously comics were a very popular form of pop culture, and in some cases, feature films have sort of been born out of. A comic book, yeah. right? Yeah, there's, so there's some examples. You know, when I sometimes when I go to a movie, I'll go, wait, I, I really I recognize that that was 
uh, that was almost the exact way that it appeared in the comic book, but that maybe in 20 years earlier. And so yeah. it's always, you know, part of this detective and sleuthing that you do is that is, you know, I think you look at a lot of the, the stories of the movies today. So a lot of the stuff that's going on, especially with Thanos, uh, a lot of things that you saw in the Transformers movie was based off of the original uh, Transformer limited series. If you look at the movie and you look at the comic, you're going to recognize a lot of segments. And, and let me show you a couple examples, which is for those that are uh, familiar with the uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movies from the 90s, um, this is a uh, this is a page and a little bit smaller. Um, you know, it's funny. Uh, Eastman and Laird, uh, Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird, who created the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Story behind it is that um, they were kind of short on funds when they started the comic book. Um, so they did whatever they could to sort of save some money. And if you'll notice, this is really sort of one piece of paper that's been sort of cut in half. Uh, and so it, it's yeah. what they call craft tint. And so what they would do is to get this sort of secondary tones on it, they would apply some some um, some chemicals to it. But it was a more expensive paper than your normal paper. So to save money, they actually cut it down even further and made the originals of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles um, really small. But, Interesting. But yeah. that being said, if you look at the scene, um, you, you should recognize it. This is the introduction of Casey Jones, who is a, a, an important character. Um, here's the Shredder, who is the, the villain in the movie, also yeah. uh, it premiered in the first issue of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles when it was there. But I think if you look at that, you will recognize and see that the movie was heavily influenced by this particular page and sequence that uh, that appeared in the comics. Yeah, and I think of the design as well, right? I mean, that's very much how I remember Shredder looking from the film. So yeah, they, they did. They did a good job and, and kept it, uh, you know, loyal for collectors. And what was the year of this Turtles piece? Uh, this Turtles, I think, came out around 1985. Five or eighty-six, maybe okay. eighty-six. So, so not too far before the, no, the film. No, a few then. years yeah. before, but you know, no color. You know, this was back when you know, frankly, they didn't have different color bandanas. Um, but the, yeah. you know, so the Teenage Mutant Ninja, Ninja Turtles, though, had their origins in sort of the independent comic art. Mm. But I wanted to show you a, a more recent example of a movie I was watching. So my my wife, um, you know, <laughs> she was like, "Hey, let's go see this Kingsman movie." And, and frankly, I didn't even know much about it, um, but. Uh, you know, frankly, I hadn't been keeping up with my comics lately, but uh, Kingsman actually started as a comic book by Mark Millar and Dave Gibbons. It says, a Star Wars fan yourself, you'd be interested to know that uh, Mark Hamill actually makes an appearance on the first few pages, uh, oh, actually go. as, you know, Mark <laughs> Hamill. And I think they actually worked him into the movie, as you probably know as Very well. Cool. But uh, they actually mentioned that they actually kidnapped Mark Hamill as part of that. So they, they had some changes to the story when you actually read the Kingsman graphic novel uh, versus what's in the movie. But when you look at these two pages, uh, you'll notice that this page right here, there's a, a sequence in there where they're looking at the, the newspapers of all the things that happened uh, while you know they were off saving the world. And the fact is that the newspaper headlines don't mention anything about it. Well, that was obviously lifted directly from this page here. And then here's where Eggsy sort of suits up for the very first time and becomes a Kingsman, sort of mm -hmm. very... Uh, you know, sort of a big spectacular page, and you know, I guess they thought it was spectacular enough that they actually included it on the back of the uh, the graphic oh, novel. That's very here. cool. Yeah. But um, you know, again, here's where you know they they took what was in the comic book and uh, adapted it for the movie. Uh, yeah. But there was there was a lot of changes I think made between the graphic novel and what actually ended up in the final movie. But great movie and great book. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, and then I think you know, as far as you know, movies go, there there are some that, you know, frankly, uh, it's harder to get, you know, as far as if you want examples. And when I look at sort of my collection, uh, for instance, Kick-Ass, which was also done by Mark Millar, and, and it was actually done by John Romita Jr. and, and Tom Palmer as the artists, um, the artwork for that has never hit the market. They actually have kept um, all the artwork uh, and haven't sold any, aside from a few, a handful of pieces that were done for uh, series or, or publications outside of the U.S. Okay. Um, or the regular publication. So the, the one example that I've been able to find for Kick-Ass um, has been this, which was done for a uh, British publication called The Shortlist, which is something that they pass out on the street. And it was at the time uh, uh, they were highlighting what was going on with the Kick-Ass movie. So I was very happy to find this. It was done by John Romita Jr. back in 2010 when the first movie came out. But it has been very hard to sort of... Um, you know, it's been hard to fill in my collection. I guess from Prop Store, I was able to get um, from Kick Ass Two. I got Hit Girls Knives uh, from uh, from the first Kick Ass movie. I have his batons, so yeah. great. But you know, and as I looked at this piece, it, it, you know, something that was missing was really sort of the tie into sort of what I wanted to do with my with my collection. It's great that I've got the batons here, but I don't have anything that shows um, her knives. And so uh, one of the things when we talked about commissions before, I was able, and this is you know, very lucky, to find 
uh, John Romita Jr. at a convention and have him sort of start a commission for me because Tom Palmer, um, again, this was a great combo that worked together, but they really wanted, if they were ever going to do a commission, um, Tom wanted to make sure that John uh, was all in on it and had, had sort of sanctioned it. And so uh, John laid out a, a nice um, hit girl image for me. And, and I asked Tom to finish it, and I said, look, I'd really like it to be in the weapons room. I'd like it to, mm -hmm. to uh, include some of the knives you know, that, that I've been able to accumulate in, in my collection. And they put together this great piece for me. And uh, you know, this is, again, a way of sort of bringing my prop collection and my original art collection together. Very cool. And so did you have to provide reference of the knives in order for I did. I did. Yeah. You know, it's strange because I think that the knives weren't as prominent when they actually drew the kick-ass book. Yeah. Um, and you'll see uh, you know, their, their version of Hit Girl you know, from the actual comic here. I wish I could have that cover, yeah. but that's one that they uh, they decided that they They're wanted holding. to sort of hold on to. Um, but I think they did a fantastic rendition, and I think Hit Girl was the, the breakout character of that movie. Oh, uh, for sure. And yeah. I'd, I'd love to see more, but, and you know, until that art is released, you know, I've got two great pieces Scratching the itch. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, superb. Very cool. Thanks for bringing these out to show us. Yeah, my pleasure.